right, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna go ahead and um, get started. Um, we have a <coughs> jazz event that we're competing with, but hopefully maybe we'll get some people um, sort of trickling in, and we are live streaming it for people at home. So I'll introduce um, the group of professionals that we have here tonight. We've had some adjustments. We had a sick child at home and then other people with family commitments that um, it's a busy time of year. Um, so we'll go through and do introductions and then I'll sort of lay the framework for our conversation tonight. Um, we're excited. We have a lot of opportunity I think, to interact with our parents who are here in person um, to talk really globally about assistive technology. And then we're gonna work our way to a real sort of narrow focus around assistive technology in terms of AAC devices. Um, or AAC support. So again, I'm Meg Kimera, I'm the Director of Student Services. We'll go this way, Kevin. Carol DeCrudelo, Student Services Administrator at Placentino. Dan, do you want to introduce yourself? From sure, come around. <laughs> Those at home who can see. <laughs> so Dan McLeod, Director of Technology. I'm going to be running the uh, PowerPoint as well, so I'm going to be back in the background too. And I'm Becky Hackinson. I'm an SLP and an AAC consultant. I'm Marie Reggio, and I'm an SLP here at Adams. And I'm Heather Nunes. I'm an SLP at Placentino. The two other professionals that were going to join us that um, were able to sort of contribute to the presentation, that, but that were not here tonight, is Adam Steiner, who's one of our assistive technology specialists at the middle school, and then Chrissy Gilbert, who is one of our severe special education teachers at Miller School. So just so you have a, a sense of our goal tonight, we're going to talk about assistive technology as this broader umbrella, and what does that mean, or what is sort of the the vision of the capabilities of providing devices or allowing students to have technology more readily at their fingertips, whether disabled or non-disabled in the district. Um, so we'll move, we'll talk about it starting from sort of a tier one, what is accessible to all students currently in Holliston Public Schools and what's our goal or hope for students um, who utilize technology and more readily on a on a daily basis in their educational settings. We'll then shift to talking about sort of tier two. So for those who have, those cohorts of students who have a more sort of prescribed um, lagging skill or focus area, how can technology that's provided to them or that we provide to them support them in lessening the impact of their disabilities? And then we'll move on to tier three students talking about a real more individualized approach in terms of assistive technology and specifically the role of AAC in supporting some of our um, learners in district. So we've gone over, sort of, if you want to go to the next slide, Dan, um, who everyone is. The next slide then um, comes from, um, in November of 2012, the Department of Ed essentially put on, put out a big pack, and I'm sure Becky's <laughs> um, familiar <laughs> with it, um, called Access to Learning, Assistive Technology, and Accessible Instructional Materials. Um, and essentially the main gist of it, or the quote following sort of all the information about how it's a regulatory and that we're authorized to really consider assistive technology for students with disabilities, talks about how um, today's technology, and I'll read directly from the quote, today's technologies have the ability to dramatically change the lives of students with disabilities, enabling them to access the curriculum, participate in learning activities alongside their peers, personalize their learning, and achieve their full potential. An understanding of assistive technologies and accessibility will help school personnel make informed decisions when they evaluate student needs. Better still, this knowledge will help schools develop educational environments and programs that can meet the needs of all students, regardless of whether they have disabilities. So again, tonight we're going to talk about sort of what technologies are available to all students and then continue to work our way up to students um, with identified disabilities. The next slide. So just to kind of ground ourselves in this tiered model that I'm sort of famous now for talking about, we're going to talk about, in general, again, about universal support. So what do we have in district from a technology standpoint for all students, for targeted groups of students, and then individual um, students. So all, some, and few. The pictures are here. Um, we're just sort of visuals that I thought to provide us to kind of get our thinking around assistive technology and, and what that means. It's not necessarily just a smartphone or a Chromebook, but what is available um, to us. And so the first one um, is interesting when you think of universal designs. This is closed captioning. And so when closed captioning was um, created years ago in terms of on your TV, it wasn't necessarily a feature that was functioning on, on all TV screens. But over time now, they consider a universal design. You can't not buy a TV, essentially, with closed captioning. So we, anybody, whether hearing or not, has the ability to have closed captioning on their device. So that is something that's universally now available 
to anyone. So you can walk through a hospital, you can even be at home and just throw closed captioning on. So that is something that is available now to all universal design. The second one, when we think of sort of a targeted group of students, this is a picture of a child using, um, who's hearing impaired, who's using a phone so he can see in order to sign to the recipient on the other end. So what are available through technologies that have grown essentially available for those who are hearing impaired? So what's that targeted sort of group? And then today, for the purposes of talking about really intensive individualized interventions, we're going to talk about AAC. So what are individualized communication ways in which we um, communicate with students who have um, disabilities that need such individualized support for them? And how are we doing that so right now under an assistive technology umbrella? So again, just to have a sense of sort of the conversation. So we're going to start with talking about Chromebooks. And Dan's going to sort of take the, not sort of, he's going to take the lead as our new position we've adopted here in Halston. Thank you. So uh, tonight we're talking about assistive tech, but honestly, it's really expanding to cover a large range of students, which is why we went with Chromebooks as our device of choice for most of Holliston Public Schools. So right now we have almost 2,800 students in the district, and we have a one-to-one -one grade 6 to 12, roughly 1,500 students. Actually, I shouldn't include 12 yet. Uh, we're phasing out BYOD at the high school, and we're instead going to be purchasing Chromebooks at town meeting just uh, last week, right? Uh, the ninth grade was approved for upcoming ninth graders were approved for purchase of Chromebooks. The Chromebooks are a great device for Holliston because they integrate seamlessly with Google Apps. We're a Google Apps district like many other school districts. And the collaboration that you can do in Google Apps is um, premier. It's, uh, no one can beat it, honestly, what Google does with that. So we went with Chromebooks there in 6 to 12 in um, grades 1 to 5, again, through capital purchase at town meeting. Thank you, town of Holliston. Uh, we have 12 to 15 Chromebooks per classroom. Grades 3 to 5, it's Chromebooks, and in grades uh, 1 to 2, this is about a minute, I forgot my Chromebook flip. In grades 1 to 2, we have what's called a Chromebook flip. So if you haven't seen one of these, it's basically, here's a Chromebook, regular old Chromebook, and changes to become a tablet. And so Placentino went with this device because it has so much flexibility, and for the younger students, they wanted that touch, and that's what this device provides. So it also provides the uh, Android Store. So the Android Store and the Google Play Store merged, and so what that did was it opened up a whole other group of tens of thousands of apps that kids can access now. So we're very excited about that. Chromebook flips in grades one and two, and also kindergarten, and we use iPads in pre-K. As far as teachers, every teacher has access to at least one device. Typically it runs the presentation system and the speakers and the sound. But many teachers are moving toward a wireless solution where they can walk around, engage with kids, help students, and not be tied to that uh, device in front of the room. That's what we're hoping. And then I'm very lucky here in Holliston to have three expert integrationists who do what I'm doing much better, talking tonight on assistive tech, uh, we actually have um, an integrationist devoted to the high school and then two split between three schools. And they do a great job, bring a lot of knowledge and expertise, especially in the area of assistive tech. But not just that, but other teachers and integrating technology. So very lucky to have those in Holliston. Okay, back to my other role. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. So now that Dan has sort of laid the groundwork for what we provide just from a device-wise to all students, we thought we'd transition into Tier 2, and I know um, that some of the folks up here will be able to jump in a little bit. So we're talking about, when we talk about Tier 2, so what are some students currently accessing based on the devices that are available here in school or that their parents are purchasing them? So on the left-hand column, we, we highlighted essentially a lot of the capabilities that the Google platform affords students, again, to sort of lessen the impact of their 
whether it's a reading disability, a writing disability, um, sort of any of those common disabilities that might fall under a specific learning disability for students. So for instance, voice typing is something that some of our students, whether disabled or not, are accessing just by purely utilization of um, uh, Google in terms of Google Docs. Um, Open Dyslexia is a Google add-on, I believe, in terms of it's a font-based um, program that students use. Um, it ca essentially catches their eye in terms of helping them read and track better. Google Read and Write, which is an additional add-on that you have to purchase in terms of um, Google, but that some students utilize, has a variety of capabilities um, that are extremely helpful for students, again, to sort of lessen the impact of their disability. And because it's on their Chromebook, it's so... Um, it's less obvious, I think, to their peers, but how they're utilizing it and how they're really fostering their independence and, and um, making it available to support their learning. So there's word prediction. These are just a couple that you can access through Google Read and Write, and then we'll show you a little clip. There's word prediction. There's dictionaries. There's picture dictionaries. There's text-to-speech. There's screen masking. So over all kinds of things you can um, imagine through you just utilizing their own um, devices that they have. Um, before we go to that video, I just want to sh talk about another thing. So there are Google extensions or add-ons, and then there's also various apps that we talk about that our technology, technology integration specialists are, are well-versed in or that our special education teachers might know. I think you say Kazina. Is that how you say that one? And this one provides voice comments. So oftentimes if you have a high school student, you'll know that they use Google Docs and they could be writing an essay back and forth with their um, teacher. Sometimes reading a comment is difficult for students and can be um, can cause a barrier. This allows a teacher to leave a voice comment. So you can hear the voice comment back and say, okay, they wanted me to add more detail here. Or, okay, they need to know what does my character look like. So it is voice comment, so it limits the idea that they're having to just strictly read editing, um, editing suggestions from a teacher or a peer. So we just highlighted a couple. I, I can provide a couple more, but do you mind playing the clip just so we have a sense of what Google oh. is we stole from our neighbors? So it's a long, it's a 22 minute video just talking about all the things that Google. The screenshot reader will be able to ins you install that and it allows uh, reading. This is talking about Google Read and Write. Uh, content that's on websites, but I'll show you some website work as well. Um, what we have here is the audio maker. So if I was to highlight any particular sentence and hit audio maker, what it's going to do is going to take that sentence and create an audio file that can then be saved. So it just downloaded this MP3 that I can then play at a later time. So. So it's playing that audio of that particular. So you can do this all in Chrome versus like learning ally versus. And then audio use the book. screen mask. So for those students that need to kind of focus on certain things, I can click the screen mask and you can see here it masks part of the screen. There are also options for um, adjusting some of the settings with the screen mask and some other some other items, right? So I'll turn off the screen mask here real quick. And I have some options, and these options can be accessed through this drop down menu on the, the right side here. So when I click options, screen masking, so I can choose what the background color might be. I can say maybe red. You can change the opacity so they can't see anything at all to just a little bit highlighted, you know, a little, little bit kind of background color. But I would say you might want it all the way opaque. The reading light color, you can choose, like I said, I had it as yellow, but I had the opacity all the way down, which means it's just clear, it's white. But you'll see, um, actually, if I go ahead and turn this on and change those options while we're going through. So you can see I have red and I have that yellow, but if I click my options, you can see in the background, I can change this yellow to that color. I can change to pink. But I'd like to put this all the way down and just make it the background of the screen. And I actually like this as dark as I can. Okay. And also the reading light, you can say this the height, so as narrow or 
as wide as you want to make it. And then we have the reading light on and off. Click OK. We can exit that. So that's our screen masking. With voice uh, talk and type, that's voice typing, within Google Docs, you'll actually have the same, um, you can click this link or you can go ahead and go to Tools, Voice Typing. And you'll see when I click this, this is a test of my voice typing and it is pretty accurate at this time as far as what it writes on the page, period. New line. And I can say new line. New line, and it will go to the next line. We can click the microphone to stop it. And you can see that it was pretty accurate in terms of what it was recording. So the voice typing is a great one for speech to text. We can remove this. Uh, we have some translating tools, again, within options. You can stop it from there. Here, um, so some of our students, I would say mostly at the middle school, they're becoming more and more versed in how to utilize some of these things that are, are currently built into Chrome. So through using their Chromebook, they have access to the Google platform and they're utilizing these. So as our educators become more skilled in those, we anticipate our kids will become more fluent. There's a feature that I was um, that I know of in terms of the Google add-on too, where you can go to a website and you can essentially simplify it so that it's pulling all the extraneous information. So you're you're not seeing any commercials, you're not seeing any of the additional text, and it's just giving you the core information for our so for our students who are having a hard time sort of sifting through all of that. There are endless capabilities at their fingertips in terms of really helping again lessen the impact of their disability, so there can be um, to continue to make good progress in a classroom setting. So from moving towards with that targeted group, we're going to talk now specifically about our Tier 3 group. And so, again, I talked tonight, we're going to really narrow it even smaller and talk about um, AAC and what that means um, for our students right now in Holliston. So I put up here before these kind of ladies take on, um, just the definition. So there was, if you haven't seen it, it's definitely worth um, looking at if you are interested or aware your student utilizes AAC supports. An April 2nd memo from the Department of Education about um, augmentative and alternative communication and how it is a form of assistive technology that can help students with disabilities that impede their ability to communicate to meet their educational goals and participate fully alongside their non-disabled peers in all aspects of their education. And that charge essentially um, put out by Russell Johnson, who's the director of special ed in Massachusetts, really continues to sort of focus and put onus on the districts around evaluating, identifying, implementing, and supporting um, AAC um, access for students in our, in our districts. Do you guys want to jump in? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Well, it's very nice to see you. I know many of you, so it's nice to see some familiar faces. <laughs> um, those of you who I have not met yet, um, I have been working in Holliston since September. Um, as an AAC consultant, and it's been an absolute pleasure. It's been um, a really great experience, so I'm happy to be here to talk more about AAC tonight. So, um, so when we talk about how AAC um, fits into assistive technology, because sometimes it can be confusing, like what's the difference between the two? If we think about assistive technology as the, <clears throat> the large umbrella of all supports that can be used um, for students, AAC is just sort of a narrower um, a small specialized subset that would fit under the umbrella of assistive technology. So the first slide just talks about the definition of AAC. And so AAC, children and adults with speech or language difficulties may need to find other ways to communicate effectively. That's just, you know, the simplest way to put it. And there are many types of AAC they can use. Um, what I like to talk about on this slide is just highlighting that um, the two parts of the definition. So. Uh, many people think of AAC as a substitute for speech, but also um, I like to highlight the augmentative part of it because AAC really can be used for, to me, for almost anyone. <laughs> um, so it's a support system that's not meant to replace speech, but to augment it, just to make it better. So because um, a lot of our users are verbal, and they're still AAC can still help them as well. So I just always like to highlight that as well. Okay. Am I going to the next one? Um, so types of AAC supports at school. So there is a wide range. If we think of the spectrum of supports um, of what AAC looks like in the school, there's a wide range. And so over here, 
if you can see my pointer. Um, this would be an example of low-tech AAC. And so when we say low-tech AAC, what that means is it's paper-based. There's It doesn't need to be plugged in. Um, there's no power source. So it's just paper-based. So that's um, a low-tech support. If we think about, you know, the communication books, anything that's paper-based is, is low-tech. Um, a mid-tech device is, um, some of you may be familiar with this um, old ebook goodie called the GoTalk. <laughs> um, it, it, that would be considered a mid-tech device because it does have a power um, supply. You know, when you push it, it'll say a word, but it's, there's no dynamic display. It's not like an iPad is not going to take you somewhere else. So it's not considered a robust vocabulary system, um, but it's sort of in between the two. Um, and then high tech is um, over here. So these are your tablets, your iPads. Um, we think of these as having dynamic displays. And what I mean by that is just, you know, when you push the button, it opens up a whole other page. So that's the, um, the range. Um, I, this um, is, if you see these hands over here, this is actually, these are in a lot of our classrooms at Halston, which is fantastic. So what this is, is a low-tech core board um, blown up. You can't really tell by the picture, but it's uh, wall size, so it's really big. Yes, it's this, um, just a lot bigger. So, okay, Dan, do you mind going to the next slide? Thank you. Okay, so these are just some more examples of what AAC might look like um, at school. Um, some people don't think of AAC, you know, when we look at um, morning schedules, all these sort of supports are also fall under the umbrella of AAC that can help our students. Um, so, and the, this is a morning schedule. So this is, you know, these are visual supports to help our students um, know, you know, what's coming next in the day. So that's an example of AC. Um, these are key rings. Um, this, um, Heather has one too. This is something um, that we worked really hard on in Halston this year. And almost, I think all the SLPs have one now. So basically this is a low tech support. Um, that you can wear around your neck, so Heather has hers, um, that can be mobile AAC, so that can go with you to the playground. <gasps> oh! <laughs> that makes me so happy. <laughs> Aren't they great? Yes, and do you like it? Having it? Yeah, it's great, right? It's super helpful. You know, sometimes having, you know, the tablet or device or whatever with you, um, you know, can be hard. So this is a really great um, alternative, and it's um, it's great. And all the SLPs, like I said, in Halston now have this. So we worked hard on making that. So that's great. And also, the two can be used together, and that's actually the best way to be using them. And you know, it's not this or that. It's not that or this. You know, when you can make a recipe of different supports in different times of the day, that's really the best way for AAC to be used, so. Um, okay, so this is, I love this picture so much. So this is Mrs. Beaver's classroom. Um, and so this is the way the classroom is set up. If you can see her chair right here. And if, for those of you who don't know, she's um, one of our preschool teachers. Um, so this is her chair, and she sits right here, and then you can't, all her kiddos would be here. And as you can see, right behind her is a large um, core board blown up, you know, to large size. So when she's talking to all of her kids, she's also pointing to the pictures on the board to support her message, you know, so that all of her learners can have that visual feedback um, for language, because that's basically what AAC, AAC is. It's a visual representation of verbal output. Um, so this is great, and many, many of our classrooms have this, which is fantastic. Um, this is another um, board that I made up. Um, this is paper-based. This is sometimes, you know, if a student is having a hard time, uh, you know, is having a lot of emotion at the time, and they need to express a feeling, um, Sometimes it helps just to point rather than to be able to say what's wrong. And, you know, if I think of that for myself, too. You know, when you get upset and you have a lot of emotion going through, sometimes it's really, really hard to access our, our speech when you're upset, when you have a lot of emotion. Um, so I really like um, AAC in times um, of stress and when there's a lot of emotion. I think AAC can really, really be helpful as a behavior support. So, All right, do you mind doing that, Sylvia?
Okay, so these are just a few key points. So the first one is aided language, which is an AAC term. And what, a, what aided language really means is that children learn AAC best when we jump in and use it with them. Um, so like the example that I just referenced to, like as Mrs. Beaver is talking to her students, she's pointing to the words as she's saying them. Like for example, it might be time to go to snack. So as she's saying go, she's also pointing to the word go on her poor board. Um, you know, if she's, she might be talking about what people like, would like to do at choice time. So as she's saying the word like, she's also pointing to like at the same time. So pairing those two together is basically what aided language is. And that's the way that kids learn it. Um, there's no, there's no um, course or anything. It's just sort of jumping in and doing it with them um, and using it alongside of them and them seeing you use it is really the best way for them to learn. Um, modeling does not need to be perfect. A lot of people get um, nervous. They say, oh, you know, this, this makes me nervous. I don't know how it works. You know, I can't get all my words out quickly enough. It doesn't have to be perfect. Um, you know, modeling, especially when you're first getting started, can just be one word or two words. You could say a whole sentence, but if you're highlighting a word or two, that's extremely helpful um, for AAC users as they're learning. Core vocabulary is another um, current um, thinking in AAC. And so what core vocabulary is mine? Did I just steal that? OK. So core vocabulary is, <clears throat> um, put very simply, it means using fewer words to say more. So. If we think about sort of the older style communication books that might have Play-Doh page, or might have Snack page, or might have Playground page. And so Playground page would have lots of lovely pictures of every single specific thing that's out on the playground. And those are great, and they have their place. But core vocabulary is very powerful, because if we're teaching our kids these very um, core words that can be used in any situation, we're going to empower them to not just be requesting. We're going to empower them to go beyond requesting, to comment, to make jokes, to ask questions, you know, to express themselves more fully. So, you know, go. Think of all the times go can be used. Um, do you want to go? Are you ready to go? Should we go to snack? Where do you want to go today? Where did you go this weekend? Um, so this is the thought behind core vocabulary, and this um, is a core board. This is one of, this is not the only core board. There are many. But basically, the thought is mostly verbs. Less nouns, more verbs. Okay. Um, okay, where was it? Oh, yes. AAC is a language. So if we think about um, how AAC is learned best, it's when we immerse ourselves in it. And I always um, love being in Holliston because you guys have the best example of French immersion, right? Um, and so children learn a second language. And sometimes we really can think of AAC as that second language if we immerse them in it, if we use it next to them. We don't ex expect kids to learn French by speaking English to them. They learn it when we speak French to them. And so AAC, it's the same thought. They're going to learn it when we are speaking it. We're speaking their language. Um, AAC can be used anywhere and everywhere. And AAC is fun. That's one of the um, parts I like to highlight. Um, one of the questions I get a lot from parents is, you know, how do I get my kids hooked? How do I get them to use it more? How do I get them interested? And my answer is always go for the fun. Um, find out what really motivates them and go with that. I saw one really cool example once of a classroom. They were working on go, so that was their word of the day. And so they, were, they pulled up the song Let It Go. And so everyone had their devices out. And every time they heard go in the Let It Go song, mm -hmm. they all found go, whether it be on their low tech board or on there. So that was a fun thing and it was super moving for the kids and I really thought that was cool. Okay. Um, so this is a really great video. Some of you may have seen, has anyone ever seen this video before? No? Okay, great. Um, okay. <laughs> nope.
Sorry, that always shocks me at the end. I wish I could cut that off, but I don't know how. <laughs> um, I really love that video just for so many reasons. Um, a few of the things that I love about it is it just, um, I love how it shows the whole family using it. Um, at school, we love to pull peers in. Peers can be so motivating with AAC. Um, one of the things I love about, um, you know, the tablets are such a part now is like all kids love tablets. You know, they're all... It's not a big, clunky, huge thing like it used to be. You know, they all flock to it. They're like, ooh, what's on that iPad? What's, you know, Johnny doing with that iPad? Um, so that's what we can do at school. You know, at home, siblings, the power of siblings also, um, you know, can be really strong too. Okay, so I did, um, there are a couple of my apps. I just put my favorite um, resources here. So Practical AAC, um, if you're looking um, for more information on AAC, I highly recommend this website. Has anyone ever been on that website or heard about it? No? Okay. Um, I love it so much. It's really um, just, if, you, if you're interested, look it up. It's great. It's really friendly. Um, it has great graphics, great visuals. They send emails weekly. Yes, like they send you emails. Just any topic under the sun, and, any, yeah. any questions at all you have on there, it's great. Mm -hmm. I lost it. Oh, you're going to it. Oh, okay. Thank you. And it's a good resource for yeah. language <laughs> pathologists too, not just for parents. Yeah. So oh my gosh! Yes, all the, time. all the time. I use it all the time. You know, so if you typed in like, um, how do I get my son to stop, you know, hitting the same button over and over again, you'll find a lot of articles. Okay. Yeah. So this is this is the website that I really really like. So, yeah. And then if you would you mind just scrolling down? If you scroll, um, and I also really like this. Yeah. If you just scroll, this is the woman who does it. She's from Florida. Um, so there's videos of the week, there's featured posts, um, and she's been doing it for several years. So um, if there's a, there's a search bar at the top, I type in, you know, questions there all the time. It's really great. Um, okay, so another um, link I think I put on there is, oh, touchchatapp.com. This is another great website that has lots of um, commonly asked touch chat questions. This is a really great channel. It's called Two Techie Mamas. I really love it. Um, it's a mom who has a daughter who has a high-tech device and uses Touch Chat, and she posts um, real-life situations that she runs into. So there's one of her like outside in the parking lot in her car with her daughter outside of Walgreens, and they're having a conversation <laughs> about something. And so she posts real life. I find it very inspiring. Um, she also does a really great job of... <laughs> Um, bless you, of showing like what modeling looks like. Like so, if you say well, aided language, yeah, I, you know, to hear someone talk about it is one thing, but to actually seeing her do it, I think is really, really helpful. So I think she's great. Um, and then there's also Facebook groups that I really, really like. There's AAC. If you type in AAC parents groups, there's tons of those. Um, we speak pod is another really, really amazing um, woman. I think she has five or six. Um, children who are all use pod books, which is more of a paper-based, low-tech. Um, she's really inspiring. She's awesome. Um, and then there's also touch chat app users group. So those are some of the favorite um, family resources that I like to share. Okay. I think that's my last slide, Dan, but yeah. can you just double check? Okay. Yeah. The last slide, so I sh I'll put it on there too, just um, just again sort of backs us up in general to the Department of Ed, what they have in terms of, you go on their special education website, they have some great, um, they list, you can read into the two, well one is the memo, the most recent memo I referenced, and then the big sort of booklet around, um, from November 2012 around assistive technology, but you'll also see there's videos there, they talk about, um, what is it, mass touch, um, there's a group in terms of sort of accessing various devices, um, so it's a good site in terms of, oh, mass match. Getting oh, I love This is my like, local. Yeah. Um, so they have a bunch of different, if you just go on the Department of Ed, they actually have a really good um, sort of site in the assistive technology um, range that covers all sort of the topics we talked about today in terms of access for students, evaluations for students, um, and whatnot. So that is the end of our output or sharing out part. Um, we, there's several of us here to make sure we engage. If there's any questions specifically that people have, I anticipate it's probably in the AAC realm. Um, but if we want to shift now and do more and engage with the audience, I don't know if that, do you want to? Yeah, do you guys have any questions? I also have my um, iPad here with lots of apps on here if anyone has any specific questions or you just want to play around or um, anything at all. 
and Becky or Marie, I don't know if there's anything more, or not Becky, Heather or Marie, if there's anything else you guys wanted to add to to just add on to some of I think we're good. We put Becky on the side. great. Thank you. Um, I just had a question about using like an AAC device like Touch Chat for more, I guess, uh, academically based, I guess, things, uh, like specifically vocabulary. So as the kids get older, the vocabulary through the spelling words or even in their reading mm -hmm. gets more difficult. But some of the words, you know, like unless they have some sort of visual or maybe a synonym, mm -hmm. um, I don't, you know, can a device like that be used in that educational realm, not only for the output, but just for the understanding piece, I guess? The um, yeah, is your question piece? sort of like how, how, is there a higher um, version of touch chat? Is that, I, I'm not sure I understand the question, just. I, you know, even like, like I said, like synonyms, it, you know, like, but with a visual, I, I wish I could give you an example of yeah. word, like, um, you know. Some of the things that we use here that, um, like, Aside from the touch chat kinds of things, um, we use Quizlet a lot where we can add our own pictures and make flashcards and, um, you know, there's like, there's picture yeah, picture dictionaries, dictionaries and, and Google apps for kids to yeah. end up with synonyms and make. Yeah. So, so are you like asking in addition oh, to. Okay, so you're asking like, is, would touch chat be able to provide synonyms and things like that? For yeah, vocabulary. touch chat or what other realm okay. in the Probably not touch chat, but I think Marie's on the right track in right. saying that there are uh, there are other options. Touch chat wouldn't give wouldn't be able to provide things like that, but there certainly are other apps out there. You said Quizlet. So I think if you're using like yeah. an iPad yeah. device, there's mm -hmm. things like Quizlet and Cahoots and things like that where we add our own vocabulary depending on, you know, <laughs> if they're doing a certain unit in school or something, we'll add vocabulary specific to that unit. Um, put our own pictures into it and definitions and everything. Okay. So, so it is visual as well. Mm -hmm. as, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's being utilized now. Yes. Yeah. Touch chat by design wouldn't replace something you're saying, only because they would want it to be strictly, you know, what the user communicates. Exactly. Versus, okay. Okay. versus generating something that might not be what their user wanted to say. Does that make sense? So, like by design, they want it to be what. It, it, like it wouldn't, it wouldn't provide a synonym or an antonym or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Right, but I think, Mom, you had a good point that we can, if we're teaching a vocabulary word and there's a student that uses touch chat, we certainly can go in and use a synonym that we know that's mm -hmm. maybe a simpler word to help them gain the comprehension of what the vocabulary word is that yeah, we're trying right. to Oh, yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I also really love um, the keyboard version, um, the keyboard on touch chat. So, like, if there's a word that... Um, they said where you wouldn't know what the picture was, you could just type it in. You know, mm -hmm. you could type in any word you wanted. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just like, I'm trying to give you an example, like an accelerated. Okay. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like a word like that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'm like, does he even know what that means? How can yeah, I go I and find so fast on right. there? Right. Right. Fast. And then you can demonstrate fast, you know, not necessarily. Or you can using. type it in. Yep. Yeah. I mean, you could just spell it. Okay. Right. But I do think I like your idea about using synonyms and using it that way to help teach the comprehension piece around any new word, yeah, that's great. Any other questions? Yeah. So <clears throat> with those um, key ring word things, yeah. it's only the SLPs, would that be something that would, oh, no. you know, chat? No. Oh. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> so student by student, are there paraprofessionals that have them? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, sorry, I misspoke. Yeah. Okay. Um, other people do have them as well, and thank you for bringing that up. That's a great point. The, the, you can say who has them. Yeah. The, oh. the paras have them. Yep, some of the teachers have the them. The teachers have them. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the point, paras, I think, you. are very important because they're with the yeah. students so much during the day. Um, so a lot of the paras have them. Would that be something that is automatic or is that something that we should be requesting for our students if we think it would benefit them? I think it's automatic for an SLP working with a student to make sure that a student always has a low tech option. So, you know, as we know with technology, batteries die all the time. Sometimes it's pouring rain outside, you know, on your way in from recess or from the bus. Right. There's things that could go wrong with technology and so you need to have a low tech backup. Right. There's so many things that could go wrong. So we always make sure there's a low tech backup that, that could be more appropriate to use. Just at the Placentino level, or do you think Marie are using that that sort of thing still at Adams? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. 
And I just to speak for myself, like I, when I first started, I tried to make sure every student had a low tech backup, and I didn't make one physically for home, but I made sure parents knew, and I sent home a link for what I used for my low tech backup, so that parents could feel free to print out on your own and just have as a backup just in case something happened. Yeah, I was wondering, did, did you make your own? Oh, I love that. That was like really. <laughs> so my, my son was in blocks at Framingham, yeah. so that was preschool, and he will. He was, by that time, he was like really nonverbal. He was saying a few words, copying it, but it was a lot of, I forgot that word, but just the Kalalia thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yes. Nassim doesn't really say a sentence. So definitely, definitely, sorry, definitely benefit a lot. Okay, first playground, then home, mm -hmm. you know? Just very basic, like now she's reminding me to talk like him. Mm -hmm. You know, talk like more basic stuff. Probably I am being more expanded in my vocabulary, but she give a, a good, you know, example about just talk like him, just basic stuff, not too much. And this is like, you know, basic, but especially when you travel or you go going out place. Like today I went to the neurologist appointment and I said he brought his, he the AAC and he was using it, okay, we're in the hospital. This is a hospital, yeah, he was touching and everything. Mm -hmm. And he saw something's grown, I, I am sad, it's okay, I said, it's, we're in the hospital. But then after that, I showed my pictures, it's okay, we're gonna have a snack, and then home, or oh, actually school, because I have the school, you know. But also when he was potty training, you know, wet and then dry, just very, Sometimes he doesn't see the word, just see the picture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's a really great point because um, <clears throat> just um, presenting it in that way is still really valuable learning time um, for our students. Even just presenting, presenting it to them and not expecting anything in return, just sort of you know pairing this with our verbal um, is really really great learning time. So it's really important. So yes, that's a great example. Yeah, Thank that's you. That's why I will keep it. You know, this is, I just, I give out stuff away, you know, but this is like, oh no, I will keep this yeah. because there is a time when they're, they the language they shot or they are having a very right. bad day yep. or the long thing to just flow away. Oh, and then we use the other one that you were saying, the, the long tech. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And that works. Great. great. Those are great examples of when mm -hmm. to use low tech. All, yeah. And I was are. thinking also when you were speaking that there are times when we need to be socially more quiet too. Like if you bring them to a concert or, or you know, some kind of performance or if you're at the movie theater. You, not to say that we should care all the time about if their child uses a device, then we should still take the device. But sometimes that volume has to be so low, you can't even hear it anymore. So it can be useful to have low tech available in mm -hmm. those times, too, yeah. or at church, or t times like that when you really need to be more quiet. Mm -hmm. And I just want to add, it's becoming such a natural piece of Placentino that a lot of the general ed teachers have those that they'll have on them on them on too and watching like the core words in the preschool i mean yeah. the other kids are using it just as much as the kids that it ne needs it so it's just becoming just a natural part of the classrooms mm -hmm. any other questions okay. comments yeah Good. sorry so I'm curious about, um, back to the, the keychain yep. picture symbols, for kids who are maybe tier two or tier three, tier two or tier one, so down at the bottom, the larger cohorts of kids. Um, it seems like we've talked about how we're using those broadly, but it seems like there are kids that have language, but it's not always functional language, mm -hmm. especially when you brought up that um, emotional piece, when there's a behavioral element or an emotional element. I feel like those kids could really benefit from having access to those keychains mm -hmm. as well, something that could even be yep. in a backpack or in a cubby or in a desk that they don't need all the time but could yep. pull out when they do need them. Yep. So is that something that we should be requesting of our SLPs or is that something that you would assume an SLP might already be thinking about for our, our students? That's a great point. Um, and I, I completely agree with you. I use that, like that something's wrong board that I made. Mm -hmm. I use that, you know, with every student all the time when there's feelings, you know, lots of feelings and behavior. So what do you guys think about that? Like at school, would you? 
Well, I think the conversations open often and automatically with the behavioral specialist. Right, on, right, on, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Victoria Briggs and yeah. that dialogue working together whenever a behavior issue comes up. Right. We're, we're working together to kind of troubleshoot helping them understand the expectation during those hard times, but also, yeah. and so you might need visual sports to help them understand the expectation, and like how that mom shared the example of first this, then that, and pairing visual supports with that, um, but then also helping them to express themselves mm -hmm. during those mm -hmm. times. So I think it is already happening, but I think if it's a concern for you at home, and you think, wow, that would be really helpful at home too, to share it with your SLP mm -hmm. and ask, like, is this something we could work on or that you could share with me what you're already doing at school so I can... Well, I guess, and that was more my question. So I know I know that there are people that make their own at home. I know mm -hmm. I've done that myself. I know there are, there are SLPs and um, professionals at school that are making them for our students, but uh, just bridging the gap between the two because communication shouldn't be disjointed. It should be fluid and mm -hmm. it should be congruent between home and school. So I just think it's an important point to bring up that um, we should be having those conversations widely about, you know, what are you using and not just at team meetings because things mm -hmm. change. Right. So whether, you know, maybe monthly or just through email, I just feel like a lot of students would benefit from having that consistency mm -hmm. that might not automatically right, be the there. same thing that's happening at home happening at school right. in terms of visuals no that's a great point just to jump in too I think yep. sometimes um, if you're not communicating with an SLP about sort of the concern too like oh do I use a pain scale when my child goes to the nurse or do I use um, a check-in scale uh, you know any sort of visual supports could be sort of interpreted by an SLP person as that's an AAC so I don't know that um, our behavior specialist or a special education teacher or even a guidance counselor might think of that as a visual aid to support a child when they're um, dysregulated or when they're struggling to sort of articulate it because they, they might not think, well, they meet what a communication disability is. But that, mm -hmm. so they might talk about it as a visual support or a visual aid. So it's sort of better educating our folks and starting with our SLP experts to sort of infuse everyone in terms of how do I use visual aids to lessen the impact of whatever it is that's arising for a student. Mm -hmm. So it's really sort of identifying, because someone might, you know, if you asked, um, I don't know, someone at the middle school, um, you know, a, a colleague of Marie's, they might say, well, I use, I've always used a visual schedule to help my child, right, say, am I in the green? Yeah, but I don't know that they would associate that with right. being um, an AAC right. support. Mm -hmm. It might be something worth just, you know, to, to bridge that gap, as you said, to um, not, uh, par parents might not all know about it. I mean, there's only a small group of us here. Mm -hmm. So it might benefit just making it a standard um, piece of information that when you know make make parents aware and show them physically this is what we're doing and this is how we do it and model it for the parents mm -hmm. so that again. the parents know what um, their child is doing at school not mm -hmm. and just talking about it is one thing but um, you know everybody learns differently obviously and a lot of people need multi sensory teaching mm -hmm. and to actually demonstrate it to the parents will give them a better idea of how the kids are learning in school and then give also them a better idea of how to carry that through at home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thank you. I think that's you know important reason why we're here, to hear your feedback. And you guys are teaching us mm -hmm. um, that that's something that we need to pay attention to. So yeah. thank you. It's really useful for yeah. us to take back and share with our Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm newer to the team for speech this year. Sorry, Eileen. Um, and I just want to say, I think the SLPs are so open and want to help parents, so I would never hesitate to email them yeah. and just ask yeah. or say, like, we're struggling with going grocery shopping right. and getting successfully out of the store, you know, mm -hmm. and just email the right. SLPs. Right. So what to ask. Like, parents yeah. should know that... This is something we can talk about. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Anything you, you you say, you know what, there's this behavior issue or there's this communication breakdown that's happening and I don't know why, just shoot an email and ask, yeah. you know, like, this is hard. Is there any suggestions that you have or resources mm -hmm. that you think would be helpful or can we brainstorm this together? Because this is a tough time that's, I think, for our day. The goal for the state in general, I mean, if you read that memo, you'll get the sense that some schools aren't even, and it's it's required, it's in their IEP under Plat B to consider communication. But so what are the depths at which people are really sitting there and talking about 
Have you assessed it? Have you assessed the needs? Have you assessed the level of services? And have and they consider in that part, have you what ways in which are you supporting the family? Because when I hear Becky talk about it's so immersive, mm -hmm. well then how skilled would I be as a parent in French if my child's speaking French all day? Yeah. And so how do we partner with you know families around that? Because communication is a major life function, just like vision or mobility. And so, mm -hmm. um, which is part of the interesting struggle with insurances and covering stuff. But You've always heard me say, I, I, I say the same thing over and over, I need the training right. as much as my son does. Mm -hmm. And um, But it took a while for me to even realize that I could articulate that, it, you know, so. And I think just to bridge off of that, I think that sometimes we think school is school and home is home. Mm -hmm. So to hear you say, like, um, you know, maybe you're having a, a hard time getting your child to the grocery store, out of the grocery store, you know, to, to be flexible enough to go to the grocery store, whatever the problem is, that that might feel like a home challenge. And so we don't reach out to ask about help. But if we're really talking about this whole child and communication across the board, then I think we need to empower parents to feel like they can ask for help, whatever methods you're using to get through those challenging moments in school, or we can be mirroring at home, and we really should be broadening that conversation. Right, I agree, and vice versa. You know, if something's working at home that can help us mm -hmm. here, that's really, really helpful for the school team to know. Mm -hmm. I think that's, um, that's been an interesting thing to watch evolve to in special education in general. So for instance, um, iPads. So we purchase iPads for, for students, right? But some students have come to us with purchase iPads. If it's a talking tool, it's going home with them because it's so individualized. So they're using it 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, but technically their school day, you know, if you look at what hours they're in school versus that they're at home. But so if that isn't being generalized and supported at home, I mean, there's so much more progress a child could make. We, w we wouldn't have a child leave for the day and keep their glasses here. You wouldn't send your kid to school and leave their glasses at home or keep their wheelchair at home. And so the, uh, the device is the same thing and sort of that capacity of it's with them all the time. So the utilization of that is so mm -hmm. key for their success. Mm -hmm. It really is. Mm -hmm. Becky, could you tell us again what your role is and what sure. your... So I um, work for Accept Collaborative. And so I am an AAC consultant, so I'm a speech therapist. So I have, I started in Hulse in September. So my role is I have been meeting with um, the SLPs um, at mostly at the elementary schools. But so if a student has um, an AAC consult on their IEP, so then I'm coming in and meeting with the SLP. So, um, and that time looks very different just depending on um, what the needs of that SLP and that student is. So sometimes that looks like um, us coming in and, you know, me getting that SLP up to speed on touch chat if that's what that student's using, or LAMP words for life. Um, sometimes they bring to me problems like, okay, this is what's happening in morning meeting, you know, Johnny's continually pushing the same button, how do I work through that? So sometimes I might hop into morning meeting, and so the two of us might sit together and work with the student there. Um, another thing I have done is I did a Thursday curriculum series so um, every six weeks I met with most of the special ed staff, not just the SLPs, a lot of the OTs and the teachers. Um, yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So um, that was an after-school session. So I would come and our topics would range from, um, you know, maybe it was touch chat questions, maybe it was just getting up to speed on what's out there in terms of AAC. Um, and what else have I done? The curriculum, that... Um, Yes, um, some you know meeting with some parents from, from you know from time to time. Programming, touch chat. Yeah, programming. So the consult would have to be an IEP. An individual student's consult would have to be something on the IEP. Okay. Yeah, so or sometimes, you. like I might say, I need help with something. Right. right. Yes. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Yes. So it doesn't have questions. to be on the I. You know, yeah. I ask Becky to come in and observe yeah. the other day. Oh, and evalu oh, evaluation. Oh, evaluation. I forgot that huge yeah. part. <laughs> Three major components. Yeah, I'm like, wait, I know I do something. There were three major components of <laughs> our partnership you. this year. We're talking <laughs> this week, actually, about part continuing the partnership into next year. But it was the IEP actual services and IEP grids, the professional development in general in terms of building capacity to staff, and then AAC evaluation. Yeah. So, for instance, like Marie might have a student at the middle school, and she'll reach out to Kelly Camp or SSA and say, I think this child might need an AAC evaluation, which is far different than just a general AC evaluation, which started percolating, a, you know, be five or six years back. And so Marie would chat with Kelly and say, I think this is somebody I want to bring back in. They'd have a consultation and decide whether to move forward with a formal evaluation. No different than if we were doing, you know, sort of that, that thought process of thinking. So Becky's also done 
AAC evals in all four of our buildings yep. this year. Yep. Um, so I, I had one question, but actually something you said sparked another question. Um, so the, the training you said you had like an after school yes. training um, and parents were involved? Paris. No, parents, sorry. Paris. 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 Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, the after, no, the after school training was for the staff. Okay. Yeah. Right. We did just try. Is there yeah. something for yeah, parents? Yeah, we, yeah. <laughs> we, we Possibly. So that's yeah. been tricky, right? And the evidence <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Shows. So we tried, what PD day was that that we had? We did. That, that was the last hour. March or February? Yeah, yeah. yeah. With, with the parents on one Friday afternoon. Yeah. 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 I don't know if you remember. So we try, so we're trying to figure out the right time. So we had one um, parent offering, Carol reached out to during parents. Day. Yep. Um, maybe two weeks or so before it, but it was during the during the day. It was a PD day, so we knew parents might be home with kids or not, but we were trying to figure out um, as an initial offering to come in to meet with Placentino SLPs and Becky at that time. So that was really a targeted group of parents who we know their children were using talking tools, essentially. So if we, as parents, wanted to get involved in stuff like that, who would we, would, would we go directly to our... Uh, our child's SLP and just say, hey, next time a training comes up, can you put me on the list? Like, or do we go, or do we have to put it in our IEP? Like, I don't get involved with what well, do you mean? Like, a, like, how do you start using, how do I use? No, no, or a training. Yeah, or or training. Yeah, yeah, training. Yeah, yeah, training or a consult with like someone like Becky. So some parents have, have reached out and have started attending like a parent consult. They'll come, you know, to a parent consult to say, hey, can I sit down and, and meet with the SLP and with Becky? Um, I think that's something that we need to get a better sense. We did that one day of sort of, I think it was a, an hour or two hours that we were inviting a few targeted parents in. Mm -hmm. um, so it's sort of figuring out the magic of scheduling of when can people come in to sit down to learn through how to use, or, or for us to model with them essentially how to use devices. Mm -hmm. And I know I've met with some of the parents of my students in, being in Placentino, they're very new users mm -hmm. of their talking tools. And so I've had a lot of parents have questions like, I have no idea what to do with this. It's overwhelming to, you know, to see like, the words and how to do it. So I have to, why don't you come in? We can kind of practice together modeling through how to actually do a, a, a talking opportunity with a kiddo and give examples of when to use it, which is all the time, but kind of like how to make, how does that look when it's, when we're saying use it all the time or as often as possible. So I, I think that's been helpful that I've got good feedback from parents saying it's really nice to have an opportunity to sit down together and actually practice using it. The other thing that I thought was helpful when I first started using talking, uh, talking tools myself was to have it with me at nighttime and try to use it with my kids during like by my typical mm -hmm. developing kids to just practice using it or using it when I was with my husband you know talking to him about what was happening doing one word at a time so maybe that's something that parents could do when your kids go to bed which seems to never happen right by the time you finally get them to bed you want to relax but maybe that's a way that you feel like low pressure to be able to practice finding where a core word might be for the conversation of what you're doing um my original question was um I uh more random something I thought of. Something that always seems to come up in our IEP meetings is video modeling. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that to me is sort of like a technology thing. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't seem like any of the class and t uh, any of the Holliston schools seems to have uh, some sort of bank of video modeling uh, that they could just like pick at, you know, like, oh, a lot of kids have uh, issues on uh, asking a friend to play for recess. Mm -hmm. You know, there there must be a lot of videos out there, but it just seems like, I, I don't know if it's the timing, like they don't have time to, mm -hmm. to put a device in front of the child to show them really quick before going out to recess, or th that's just an example, right. you know, going out to recess. No, or I, yeah, I love video modeling, and that is actually one of the things that we have talked a lot about at our trainings, right? Mm -hmm. So um, Touch Chat actually can store um, videos, so you could push a button that says, say hello to a student, or say hello to a friend, and it pops up a video that shows you exactly oh. how to do that, yeah. Any button on Touch Chat can play a video, but any single one. I think Alina's talking more about like an actual, yeah. already made <laughs> video model for a student. Like like it it. No, but yeah. For, uh, well, yeah, you I could mean, pull yeah, up like a YouTube game. video. Well, like it's nice, that. yeah, for my yeah. individual, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, you know, kiddo. Mm -hmm. But it would also, I think, for the general public of the school, uh, the population of kids, to have some sort of bank 
like I don't know yeah, what the do, awesome. Google Docs or whatever. I don't think we have that. The, I think that's a time. the teachers or yeah. paras or. I personally make my own, like through Pictello. Mm -hmm. Do you guys know about Pictello? Yes. Okay. So that's all, also something used in Halston is Pictello. I think mm -hmm. almost uh, all the mm -hmm. iPads have Pictello. But where where is the share? You know what I mean? Like where? Right. Like mm -hmm. you might make them. Where are they? Well, I mean, at <laughs> Boston Children's Hospital, the Virtual Autism Center. I don't know if you know about that. Um, so it's they created an autism center. <laughs> at Boston Children's Hospital and within so it's virtual so it's not a physical space but it's a virtual resource so you can go online and just type in autism Boston Children's Hospital and they have over 90 of those video models you're talking about it's just a cool. good resource yeah, that's awesome. so, yeah. So I, yeah like yeah because most of my things is like for the school so right like, you know like so so maybe that's something we can work on yeah, for that's Holliston awesome. but it's a nice yeah. you can draw from that yeah mm -hmm. no I'll look that up that's awesome yeah. But I, I do agree. Video modeling is fantastic, and I encourage everyone to use video modeling. It's fantastic. Yeah. Um, I just feel like when the moment comes, it's almost like the teacher, whoever is with <coughs> the the kiddo, they need to search for a video. You know, and it's well, like, why, why isn't there a that's bank That's why out there? I love mm -hmm. the video component of Touch Chat is because you're already using yeah, it. Like it's that. with you, and so you can push it, and it pops up. Um, a video. Like a YouTube video. Did you guys know that? Oh, yes. Marie also, Marie, Marie also brings up a good point that it can play any YouTube video. That just got, that's just, mm -hmm. just got released yeah. um, like a couple of weeks ago. So because people. You can people, choose little clips. Yeah, you can you choose clips. Yeah. YouTube. It's just yeah. a clip. They, you yeah, it doesn't. It to the device. Yes. Can you, can you show yeah. us how sure. to do that? Yeah. Okay. I'll wait till the questions are gone yes, and then I'll yes. do that. Yeah. And I can show you how to play a video too if you want. Um, my question or comment is um, about just consistency because what I'm hearing is there's like a ton of really awesome technology that the school is using, but it doesn't seem like the parents are aware of it. So I'm wondering if there's some sort of protocol or for the SLPs if there's like an automatic assistive, assistive technology um, assessment that they do and then if they then could share that with the parents. So for example, in your case, they have that technology at the school that could benefit you, but you weren't aware that it was even available through speech to whatever whatever we said that that was. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering what, you know, and I know, for example, in, in my circumstance, I actually did have a consult with you, which was extremely helpful, but I know that some other parents at other schools or that might have different SLPs were um, not allowed that opportunity. So I'm just wondering uh, I guess my question is about consistency and protocol, and if we're utilizing all of these awesome resources the best of our ability if the parents don't necessarily know about it. Mm -hmm. um, so do you mean consistently, like, all the parents knowing everything that's available and out there? I mean, I think that's important. Yeah. But even just consistency among Back schools, buildings amongst and, buildings, mm -hmm. amongst, you know, SLPs. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I, as parents, I know we're like, okay, well, we talk, obviously, and we're like, well, you know, my right. child's right. doing yeah. X, Y, and Z, and then they're like, well, wait, wait a minute, well, you know, and yeah. so it's kind of like... Right. No, I understand, and I think we hear you on that, definitely. I think um, I can say just from a positive, like this year, I think it's been really great, and I don't know if you guys agree, that getting together after school on Thursday afternoons has been a huge step for the Holliston team in terms of consistency, because they're all getting that same information from me at the same time, and they're all knowing what's available. And I think that's been huge. Do you guys agree? Would you guys agree with that? Yeah. So um, thank you for Meg for inviting me to that. And I think it would, you know, it's been a great idea um, because I don't think that that, that was probably a challenge. Like, um, you know, school to school, it was hard to know, well, what are they doing over there? You know, do they have the same key rings? You know, now everyone's, we all decided on the same key rings. You know, we all have the same boards and they're all getting the same information from me. Um, so that's just one positive step I step I can share mm -hmm. to your comment. No, and I yeah. think it was a, you know a great thing that you came on board as a consultant and I and I think that um, consistency is important because you're working at Placentino and you're doing something and you want to make sure that that follows them mm -hmm. to Miller and, and for the rest of the way. So I just you know that's just my comment is that okay. um, one of the things that I see not necessarily directed to you but to you yeah, know no, everybody no, I appreciate is that it. and that's I think that's why we're here. It's important. Yeah. I think there's also this consistency, but there's also still how do you individualize for a child. So individualizing for a child for the purpose of AAC is a 
a separate piece and consistency in terms of parent expectations around how we utilize consultants or our access to them. Yeah. Um, we just actually, Carol, Eileen, and I met with all the SLPs at Miller mm-hmm. and Placentino to sort of do a debrief of how did this year go, what was your feedback, um, where do you want to go from here, and everyone was extremely I think felt very comforted by having Becky as this person who's helping to sort of further strengthen whatever skills they already have in that area because we had pockets of that. Um, but as technology is, I mean, to your point, parents are even saying we, this is coming at us so quickly. Um, and so that's, that's key for us. That's key for a lot of districts to figure out how to keep up with the pace of that. Mm-hmm. And then communicating that to the parents yep. too, I guess, would be the next step to that. So good. Which is why we're here tonight too. This is part of that, right? You know, I just have a point. I guess even like the parents, the parents are the ones who have to show up, you know, have to speak and have to come to meetings. And, and if, you, if you're not interested in so where are you going to get all the information, you know? I bet just there's a lot. We are not only the moms here. We are more moms, but we have to, you know. Right, but we appreciate that you guys are here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and also, I have to go now. Yeah, my husband is struggling with grief. And right now, I have to put a baby to sleep. <laughs> we understand. But yeah, thank you so much. This one was really, in, you know, all very good advices and everything. You thank know. you for coming. You're welcome. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. If anyone wants to see how to make a video come alive, is anyone else interested in seeing that? Oh, yeah. Okay. All right.